Ever since I heard the opening notes of Lisa's Oath Sign and Fate Zero, I was hooked. Fate Stay Night became a franchise I just could not get enough of. From the incredible fights, awesome characters like Seibasan, and the memes. Oh boy, the memes. But even the plethora of spinoffs like Fate Apocrypha, I just couldn't get enough of it. And ever since 2006, for 13 years, the Fate franchise has been building to this one singular moment. This film is the culmination of a whole franchise. Much like Avengers Infinity War, this is Fate Stay Night. Heavy Feel 1, Presage, Flower. The fourth Holy Grail War, a long-fought war for the coveted Holy Grail, grants the winner of a hellish battle royale one wish that they truly desire. Shiro Imiya finds himself in the middle of this war, just like he did 10 years prior when he was rescued by his adoptive father, Kuritsugu Imiya, from a great fire that destroyed Fuyuki City. Now fully grown up, Shiro carries on the dream of Kuritsugu to be a hero just like his father. But one night, he was killed and revived by Rin Tosaka, a master in the fourth Holy Grail War and a fellow student. And later that night, he is attacked again, and during the attack, he summons Saber, his servant in the Holy Grail War. This war isn't fought by people, but by historical figures from the past who gave up their bodies to be a part of the Holy Grail War. Who will prevail in this? fourth Holy Grail War. Heaven's Feel is a trilogy of films that is the culmination of 13 years of Fate Stay Night adaptations based on the three routes of the 2004 visual novel of the same name. This route is based on the Heaven's Feel route, which is easily identified as Sakura Mato being the main heroine and the much darker tone that is more in line with its prequel series, Fate Zero. Tamanori Sudo is directing this film. He has in the past worked on UFO Table's Fate series and directed an episode of the Garden of Sinners, which is set in the same universe as Fate. With each Fate series, each one usually has some sort of tone they're trying to achieve, and along with that, they are able to separate themselves from different routes altogether. Fate Route is about a romance between Shiro Imiya and Saber. That anime has a lot of problems, and the VN does as well, but Fate Route is distinct and different because it feels much more like a love story. And they do try to go further with it, with Saber and Shiro Hero's ideology clashing. What's love without a little pain? And that's kind of what Fate Route is all about. Two totally different people coming together and trying to find some sort of common ground. It's a rather beautiful story to be honest. Unlimited Blade Works is completely different from Fate Route with the tone shifting to be more about a battle with oneself and changing old ways. To put it simply, it's about Shiro's journey to care about himself and to be selfish sometimes rather than giving his life up to an ideology. One of the best quotes is from Archer when he tells Shiro to die and drown in his ideals. UBW has some powerful and meaningful messages, and while it forgoes the emphasis on romance to focus more on this and its action, it's one of the best in the series overall. Now for Heaven's Feel, and while I haven't figured out what the message to the trilogy is just yet, I've only seen one film so far, the tone shift is distinct from the beginning. This is a major tone shift for the series, one that is most similar to 2011's Fate Zero, which serves as a prequel for this film. This film is dark and heavy, and that's to be expected from VN fans, as they got this story before everyone else did. And while I can't say for sure what these films are going to focus on in terms of its message, I can say they touch on many aspects that other Fate anime don't, and one of those is the idea of family. And while I'm not sure if I can exactly explain this one perfectly, I'll give it a shot as I really think there is something here. So, Rin Tosaka and Sakura Mato are actually sisters, and Sakura was sent off to live with the Mato family in Fate Zero. And we see in one scene, Tosaka mentions this to Shiro. This is a very good topic to explore, because ever since Fate Zero, I've always wanted more development for these two sisters' story of being split up. I want them at some point in this film to get back together and acknowledge that past. I think the way the films are headed, this is one thing I hope gets addressed. But this idea of family plays into pretty much everything in this film. Shiro Emiya taking on the role of his father as a hero, Tosaka Rin entering the Holy Grail War because that's what she has been raised to do, Shinji Mato trying to take over as the next in line of the Mato household. This film plays a lot 
into that family dynamic. But the biggest one is this film dealing with the idea of facing your truest and darkest self. The idea of this film seems to be through letting in your dark side, you'll accept who you truly are. And this makes sense regarding the ending of this film, which I will talk about here in just a moment in the spoiler section. But I really think this is such a unique way to set itself apart, and I think it's one of the main themes this film hangs its hat on. It's something everyone faces every day, the demons we have we all have them. And that is an example of our darker sides. It doesn't mean we are all murderers on the inside, but we all have our issues that only we can deal with. This is to me what I think the film may be going for here. You can't just push away those feelings and let them fester or shut it off. You have to live with it and accept that part of you and love it. That's the only way that you'll get through it in the end. And while I think we'll get more of this theme in the next set of films, we can already already use examples in this one, though there are few. So spoilers ahead for the end of this film. So now this is the part where I tell you that, hey, if you don't want spoilers, you should probably click off or, you know, skip to the time code. Just saying. So three, two, one. You're about to get spoiled if you haven't seen it already. At the end, Saber confronts herself after being defeated by True Assassin, and what she sees is the Holy Grail. She tries to reach and grasp it, it's right there after all, but there is someone there with her, and it's Dark Saber, aka Dank Saber. This is our first time seeing Dark Saber in canon, Fate Khalid of course introducing her to Fate years prior, and let me tell you, she's awesome. But this is an example of what I'm talking about. Saber chooses to confront herself rather than be defeated by Assassin. It will be interesting to see in the next film how Saber confronts herself and deals with all of this. It's an interesting concept that the most lawfully good character in Fate will have to confront her deepest and darkest side. And this is because in the last two Fate anime, we've learned that Saber did a lot of bad stuff to defend her country and her position as king. She would go on war paths to do the things she did in the name of justice. So I fully expect for this next film to cover Saber's past in more detail. Now that we're done with spoilers, I think this film is about as good as this film can be. And I don't mean that as a slight against the film, though I guess you could say it is an issue with the film. I think it's rather good, though, that they made the first film so dense with information and story. This is one of those films that after watching it four times, I'm still finding new things about the film that is new to me. If your attention lapses for one minute, you could potentially miss a lot of stuff on the story and I like that. But I also understand why it's not always a good thing to have. This film demands your attention for its two hour runtime, and that to me is good because it gets you more involved with the story, which altogether makes the film that much more memorable and a special experience. What's the point of a film if you don't have to pay attention to it? I like how it's focusing on getting this beginning stuff out of the way because we've all seen it for 13 years now and it's better to get the whole Saber attacking Archer thing out of the way quick. This film has a great sense of urgency to deliver to you this epic first act in a three film trilogy. It feels new and it feels different. And that's important. I think moving this series into a trilogy of films rather than a TV series will do a lot to help set this series apart from UBW and Fate Zero. While I understand the argument for a TV series and I agree with it sometimes, I think for this, and most importantly, I think we've seen enough of Fate Stay Night that we don't need that anymore. For now, let's try something different. I know it's fun watching things weekly and to have 24 episodes rather than 6 hours of film, but it can't be denied there is a massive importance put upon this film than a TV series that wouldn't be able to match it. Heaven's Feel is a film that will wow your senses, it will give you that spectacle, but this film isn't 
as much of a story builder as it is a character builder and more of a fighter. I'm very interested in the story going forward. This film has left me wondering while this story will be taken as everything is pretty much a far cry from what all of the other fates are about. This film left me with a sense of hopelessness and uncertainty for the future of our favorite characters. And when is the last time fate has done something like that? As for the characters, we fate fans have been around the block a time or two now for a very long time. We know the fate route. We know UBW. We know the basis for all of these characters now. But Heaven's Feel, depending on if you've played the VN or not, seems to set up a future where everything we know about this will be flipped on its head. In this film, we're already seeing different sides to these characters, though they may be subtle. For example, Shiro Imiya in this film brings out his more protective side when it comes to Sakura Mato. He invites her to live in his home to protect her from the Mato family, particularly his brother. And while this isn't anything new to Shiro's character, he was this way with Saber and the Fate Root to a certain extent. As an example, wanting Saber not to have to fight anymore. While it was in Fate Root, it just wasn't quite as prominent as it is in this film. At the sight of seeing Sakura with a bruised face, he goes on the hunt for Shinji. And there is reason to do so. Shiro has really grown to like Sakura deeply as a person ever since getting to know her. He's had to teach her so many things that we normally take for granted like folding clothes. The relationship is rather innocent and cute in this way, and it works for Shiro to want to protect Sakura. He's like the protective brother who just wants to make sure she's doing all right. But otherwise, this is the same Shiro Emiya we've all either come to love or sadly come to hate. But most surprisingly is that this is the best version of Shiro Emiya so far in all of Fate. Fate Route and UBW routes don't really adapt him very well. You can't really follow his decisions sometimes because they're not really, if ever, explained well enough as they are in, for example, the visual novels. So far, the only way to truly experience an accurate representation of Shiro Emiya is to go out and play the V-Ins, which isn't difficult by any means, but is rather annoying as there is no official release in the West. And based off previous comments made by the creators, this is something that will likely never happen. Which is a crying shame, because Shiro is such a great protagonist for the Fate series, and Heaven's Feel nails him pretty much perfectly in this first film at the very least. Granted, I have not played the Heaven's Feel route in the visual novel, but based off my prior experiences with the VN, I can say this is the Shiro Emiya that hardcore Fate fans really love. Now, let's talk about Rin. A small thing I really enjoy about Rin Tosaka and Shiro in this route is the return to them trying to figure out if they like each other or not. I don't know about anyone else, but for me, I've always enjoyed the chemistry and dynamic of Shiro and Rin. It's much like a sister-brother kind of feeling between the two that just works in most configurations you put them into. I greatly enjoyed their interactions in this film, and while it lacks the hilarity of UBW's rather comical and funny interactions and scenes, you get a feeling these two are just always meant to clash on some level. In the Fate Route, she's the mentor who teaches Shiro magic. In UBW, she's the endearing big-hearted heroine. And in Heaven's Feel, she's... she's... she's none of that. Well, of well, of course, she is some of each of those things. She's still Reen after all. But in this first film, she takes a step back to let the Shiro-Sakura relationship take hold. And this was the best thing to do for this character. Because up until now, she's kind of been in a majority of the Fate series. Hell, she kind of carries the 2006 Fate Route adaptation on her back. She's the glue that keeps most routes together and moving forward. Reen in many ways, is a vehicle for every fate before her, and we still do get those moments where Rin just might hurt Shiro badly, and that's probably good enough. And now, the star heroine of this route, Sakura Mato, or as we'll be referring to her from now on, Thick Purple. Anyways, Thick Purple before this really didn't have much of any roles in the previous animes. In the Fate Route, she was jealous of Saber and Tosaka, said senpai a couple times, and then left 
to go start a BDSM club? In UBW, she was pissed off at Shiro for living with Saber and Tosaka. I mean, who wouldn't? Greedy ass Shiro taking all the women. Said senpai a couple times, got mad at Shiro, and then disappeared? Well, now in Heaven's Fuel, she doesn't get pissed at Shiro. Wears a nice dress on occasion. Wears that dress in the snow until her toes are thick purple. And by the way, I, in case you're wondering, I had to censor the feet because you never know, man. You, you never, never know. know. But joking aside, thick purple is to me a much better character than she's ever been. For years now, she's basically been a walking catchphrase rather than an actual character. And that's no diss on thick purple. She played her role, and she played it well. But, in Heaven's Feel, her character is much more fleshed out than ever before. One of my favorite things about her is that you really get the sense that she has a really strong internal strength. In other words, she's kind of like an emotional rock. She can take a pounding, in more ways than one, get up, take some more, and have the wherewithal to keep a level head about herself and do what she needs to do to survive. She's actually a very inspirational character in that sense, and that's why her character here is so infinitely more compelling than her saying senpai a couple times and then disappearing. That's still not a diss on her character, I've seen that montage. And another thing about her character is that you get the sense that all she ever really wants to do, the one thing that she strives to accomplish over everything else, isn't even that great of a thing. She just wants to protect the time she shares with Shiro, and <laughs> that's absolutely adorable and one of the most innocent nuances with her character. You see, Thick Purple doesn't have these desires to be the greatest Magus ever, or to win the Holy Grail, or to start a harem, Shiro. She just wants the precious time she spends with Shiro to never end. This really puts into perspective Thick Purple and the other routes as well, which is kind of why you're supposed to watch all the routes anyways. But anyways, maybe she was always just misunderstood as being a walking catchphrase, and from the beginning, all she ever wanted was just an innocent desire to spend time with the person who gave her a chance and let her flourish as a person. Shiro is the change that Thick Purple needed because she even says herself to Shiro in the film that she saw him the first time and all she wanted him to do was to just fail at jumping over the pole and give up. But as she kept watching him, she wanted him to succeed more and more until that eventually became more of an unrequited love. Thick Purple is so innocent so meek and quiet, a very gentle character that on the outside looking in, you just want to protect. But in reality, Thick Purple perseveres through her hardships and struggles and fights for a future that may be almost unrealistic in her mind and everyone else's. And this is where she kind of gets her stubbornness. She won't give up and she won't change her mind once things have been settled. Because while saber has her strengths in terms of her physicality and battle prowess, and Reen has her magical knowledge and thigh highs, Thick Purple has her stubbornness, has her internal strength to carry on to the next day to get some free time and hang out with her senpai. I like her. I think she is in this way, <laughs> honestly, probably the only way, the most relatable character in Fate. And that can't be said for many other characters in this series as they're all based off historical figures who are portrayed as larger than life. The only other one may be Shiro Emiya, who, I mean, come on, he's a genius, you guys. He's one of the only people to figure out that, that people die when they are killed, you know? Now on to Saber-san, who may be one of the more interesting deviations so far. I won't say much, but Saber really has been one of the most interesting characters in all of Fate so far. This makes sense, she is the face of the franchise. From Fate Zero all the way to this film, Heaven's Feel, she's had one of the most detailed character arcs in the series history. She's constantly, always struggling with her past actions, most evident in Fate Stay Night 2006, or or you can call it the fate route, where she is regularly challenged on her ideals by Shiro. We've always seen glimpses of an interesting twist for Saber's character, and this is the film where we finally see all of it really come to a head. In this series, more or less, it's set up in a way where Saber will have to confront her deepest, darkest side of herself, and I for one am on board for that. But overall, this film is heavy on the setup for the next two films. We get glimpses and ideas of 
where it'll be taken, but never any definitive direction of where things will be going. And this is intentional, of course, because the way this film is set up, you're supposed to have questions, but not answers to basically any of it. And from a character writing perspective, it's a virtually perfect film, and I cannot wait for its sequels to come out. It's pretty weird as a Fate fan who is currently going through the VNs and seeing Takashi Takeuchi's designs on the big screen with a super high budget. His original designs are so memorable and influential to this day, and they get a level of shine that even Fate Zero or UBW couldn't give them. Both Hisayuki Tabata and Atsushi Ikaria are the pair behind bringing them to the big screen. And just, wow, am I blown away by characters like Shiro, who has an impressive six-pack washerboard abs, Saber, who always looks like Saber, Shinji, who, well, uh, he looks like Shinji, I guess, and Sakura, who looks super thick and super purple. Hashtag thick Sakura. Make it happen, people. I'm impressed by each character's design and how sharp and clean they are. They all have their usual depth that Ufo Table is known for, but just more. Which is a trend in this film's art design and direction. This isn't a film that does anything that's new for Ufo Table. Quite the contrary, actually. This film just does an UFO table production, but at the highest budgets possible, with the highest quality possible. If you've seen UBW or Zero, then it's just those, but in the most polished state humanly possible. This is evident by the show's backgrounds, which are probably the best the studio as a whole has ever produced. The alley in the Saber and Rider fight is a great example of this. The alley is run down, full of garbage, puddles from uneven pavement collecting water, and the complexes that make up the alley all being run down. These are probably some of the best CGI enhanced backgrounds in the industry as a whole. And that's just the CGI enhanced backgrounds. There are also 2D backgrounds, and while these are sparingly used, there are some amazing Amazing examples with shots like these. This is another example of Ufo Table's strengths in these worn down urban environments, but it's a rare example of Ufo Table's expert use of 2D. This film seems to outdo even currently airing Ufo Table properties like Kimetsu no Yaiba, and while that isn't an entirely fair example, it just goes to show that the studio really made a technical powerhouse with this film. This anime is a pure spectacle from beginning to end. I don't think it's surprising in the least here to say that this is some of Ufo Table's best work to date. The production values are higher than they've ever been, and Unlimited Budget Works is in full effect with this film. But as I say that, Nothing is perfect either, and regrettably it will show minor weaknesses from time to time. In this film, Ufo Table uses a lot of CGI with 2D, and while their CGI is impeccable, a lot of the times in this film, especially during the Lancer Assassin fight, it shows its weakness. Background models look low poly, the CGI doesn't match up with the 2D so it looks floaty, and generally it feels too ambitious and on rails during fights like this. And this is pretty much all because it feels like a clashing of styles between 2D and 3D CGI. But even though it looks uncanny to the eye, they still manage to synchronize these scenes cameras, movements, and animation up close enough. I could not have asked for a better use of this though, even though I think this is one of their weakest examples in terms of how they use 2D and CGI together. Like I said earlier, this anime is a spectacle, and in every scene it feels like they're throwing caution to the wind to give you that spectacle. This film feels much less grounded than, say, UBW is with its fights, as it feels like a blockbuster film with unlimited budget. This is evident in the Saber vs. Berserker fight, where every move from Berserker seems to have the weight of the world put into it, and Berserker's inhuman speed feels so unnatural and frightening to see. Saber as well looks like a ballerina dodging Berserker's blows, trying not to get hit by his deadly strikes. While this fight does happen in UBW as well, this one took extra care to make it feel different than in UBW. This feels more like a brawl, and heavy power moves and desperation counters and parries than UBW's more spaced out encounter was. 
Another example of the spectacle this movie has and its ability to cram as much into its two hour runtime is a humorous fight between Saber and Ryder. And while I won't say much in the way of spoilers, the fight uses chains here and I could not be happier. It's always a treat to see Ryder's chains in use because it's such a unique and fluid weapon that you don't have to personally know what they feel like. You can just imagine. Chains are chains and, and those things are brutal and they convey that really well in this fight not only that but they convey the fluidity of the chains and their movement at the high speeds rider throws them at they're very careful as well to not make them seem rubbery like a rubber band either while this fight may be overlooked in terms of its technical prowess it's one that simply for its timing and great sense of urgency will be remembered by me for quite a while. It's undeniable that this is a production based around its action and animation. So from a general and overall feel, the movie is so very good at moving really well. Even smaller things like when Sakura fiddles with her ribbon when she's nervous, or the odd usage of CG that looks way too fluid and unnatural at times. Even that looks good to me, and of course the CG stuff that looks too fluid is an intentional thing, and adds to the style that this anime is trying to pull off. And while this film lacks on a lot of things like facial expressions, which I personally am super disappointed in, I mean just take for example that dinner that Kirei and Shiro have together, it was a bunch of deadpan and some minor emotions. This is stuff you'll notice subconsciously over time, like me, until someone brings it up and then you'll notice it. So the effect that it has on the film isn't really monumental and it isn't a huge deal at all but what's important here is the film's animation is from my perspective a virtually perfect animated film yuki kajira returns again to score for fate and as always she is impressive. Each fate she scored always seemed to have their own sounds and tone to them. Fate Zero being a darker and more dramatic tone which lends a lot to the depth of each scene involving Kuritsugu as an example. This was one of the triumphs of Zero was how the score worked and intertwined its way in and out rather fluidly. Then you have UBW which almost has no comparison to Zero's darker tone and while that's still there in some respects, Yuki seemed to be aiming for a more action oriented score with the most notable examples of course being during those heavy action sequences and it's no surprise that each of these scores so far have their own charm and standalone appeal yuki said as much in many interviews i read in preparation for this review but in this film i'm almost surprised as i was going in expecting more of fate zero and what i got was almost something totally different instead of using her traditional method yuki flips the script here and goes for a traditional orchestral score. Remember when I said earlier that this film feels more like a blockbuster epic? Well this is one of those reasons as to why it does. The use of this very orchestral, very gritty, raw sounding tone helps to capture and sculpt the film's style of music. And what makes this all the more impactful is the use of musical silence. For a great majority of this film, there is just no music playing. And this contrasts rather heavily when the music plays with its heavy strings and orchestra. Suddenly, things seem more serious when there is no music. I like it. This technique plays rather nicely with the tone of the film. It builds up a tremendous amount of tension. And the main reason for this is because during the dialogue heavy scenes, the moments without any fighting, there is rarely any, if ever, any music playing. Like I said moments before, this film is mostly just without a score, saving it for the big fight scenes. This is an advantage to much of this film as without the music, it helps build up that darker tone. Without music, everything becomes just a little more serious. It's a signal to the viewer that they should pay attention to every word spoken, which is smart on Yuki's part as she likely realized that the film's dialogue would be greatly important, so she knew that there didn't have to be a heavy emphasis on music all the time. This was a brilliant choice in my opinion. And since the music is only present during the ever amazing action scenes, let's dive into that. Yuki's score here is much more orchestral, implementing a much, much darker tone than in previous 
installments. I particularly love the usage of a drum set and bass guitar with a strings arrangement playing a furious tone over the very almost rock inspired sound. Though the drums aren't really dominating here as much as the strings and bass guitar seem to take center stage in songs featuring that arrangement. But I think my favorite use of score is around the 25 minute mark. A short replay of the events you'd see in UBW and Fate Route play and then an introduction by Zoken on the mechanics of the battle royale. This is easily one of my favorite scenes of the film as I love this song that plays and it comes out of nowhere with a great way to kick the film into its second act. It's just what the film needed and Yuki's arrangements here made the scene memorable and exciting. Yuki usually does a great job at scoring Fate and it's no different here and it's one of her better examples of how she works and how much of a great and talented musician she is. There is a reason I say her work on the first season of SAO is one of her best, despite how much that anime is critically panned and memed into the ground. She is usually always a great talent, and I enjoy her work here. Most, if not every cast member returns from UBW and Fate Zero for Heaven's Feel, and the real challenge for this dub would be dealing with the show's weak facial expressions. With the actors having close to nothing to really play off of, it was all about how well the ADR director Tony Oliver did at directing the cast. And honestly, they did a really great job with the dub here, and I have to commend the cast in general for their hard work. Some of these voice actors like Julianne Taylor and Mela Lee have been around since the 2006 Studio Dean anime voicing Fujine and Reen Tosaka respectively. It shows that these two voice actresses in particular know the roles they're playing like the back of their hand. To me, these two are probably the best at their given roles within this anime, and they absolutely nail it. As for the current cast and crew like Shiro Imiya, voice actor Bryce Pappenbrook, he once again is a perfect fit for the Shiro character with his shrill but powerful voice. And while I do like the original 2006 voice actor for Shiro more, you can't deny Bryce simply does this character better in a lot of key ways. The legendary Carrie Walgan returns with a much darker take on the Saber character, one we haven't quite seen before. One that has to face her darker side. This is one of the more interesting takes on the Saber character in the series at this moment, and Carrie brings back that stoic and badass heavy sounding voice to the big screen. While I do like the 2006 Saber as it matches up more to the original Japanese voice actress, which is highly memorable, this Saber is just so cool to listen to. She evokes a strong king who is good at slaying her enemies and confronting challenge after challenge without much if any falter. And finally, the last character I want to focus on, and probably the one I was so unsure of going in, was Christina V's version of Sakura Mato. Now to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of Thick Purple, as for much of Fate Route, she did absolutely nothing. And while she had a presence in UBW, my main focus was on Shiro's story, not hers. And this is something I haven't seen brought up a lot, if ever, and if you think about it, Sakura is kind of a massive mystery. We hear a lot about her, people say all the time she's their favorite character, and it's not just because she's thick and purple. This all with basically no knowledge of her character. So now let's skip forward to Heaven's Feel. How did Christina V do? Well, to put it simply, Christina V knocked it out of the park as usual. She's a very, very good talent to have not only in a series like this, but just one in general. She could do many kinds of voices from the saber-like voice she did in Konosuba's dub, for example, to the meek and shy sounding Sakura Mato that we see here. And to me, she kinda is the voice of Sakura because not only do I think she has a more unique voice than Noriko Shitaya for Sakura, but I think she represents that weakness and uncertainty very well. In Sakura. That being said, the movie itself doesn't help much to convey this at all thanks to the weak facial expressions. And that's the biggest weakness of this dub really, is that the English voice actor seems somewhat out of place with some facial expressions. When Bryce puts his all into a scene, I feel like the anime is failing the voice acting more often than not. And the reason I'm trying to nail this point home again is because they're weak when everyone else in this film is presented so strongly in all the other aspects. It's this film's one and probably only red mark against it, and it's one you will Absolutely. And it's one you may, may not notice. The only times I ever felt they were anywhere near up to quality is the action scenes. Some Fujine scenes as well, but let's be honest here, it seems they really love animating her in Fate anyways. And little things like Sakura's ribbon and her worried face. As a whole, I think the dub is voice acted 
pretty much perfectly. Bryce Pappenbrook absolutely nails this version of Shiro. Carrie Walgren is amazing as always with her stoic version of Sabasan, and Christina V brings a character to life with Sakura Mato. And as well, faithfuls like Crispin Freeman as Kirei, who is a really awesome scene in this film, Tony Oliver as the cocky Lancer, and Stephanie Shea as the psychotic Elias Ville von Einsburn. This film is stacked with talent, and it's one of the best performances from this group I've seen. In closing, Heaven's Feel Presage Flower is a great example of what fate does right. Character development and payoffs. In many ways, this film is kind of the greatest hits version of the first season of a fate anime. It plays the songs you know, it plays them really well, and we can all sing along to them. But while this may be, the film suffers because it does have a very breakneck speed in which it delivers the goods. If you zone out even for one minute, you've probably missed something. This is not a film you get into without watching Fate Zero and Unlimited Blade Works, at least. This is a film you watch when you've seen all of the other mainline Fate anime, because this is this is kind of like Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. There was a reason Fate took 13 years to get to this moment, and it's important you experience some of those 13 years before jumping into Heaven's Feel. And if you're wondering if I recommend this film, of course I do. I spent this much time on a review. This is an amazing film, and it's virtually perfect in so many ways. So, before we do the whole outro thing that I usually normally do, this video took so, so long to make. Months of time and preparation and reading interviews and sadly, I didn't get many great interviews for this film. I hope that changes when I go over for Heaven's Feel 2. I hope we have a whole bunch of great reviews so I can pull from and use in this review for the second film. But I do want to ask, I, I don't like to ask for likes too often. I have to do it now these days, but for this one, seriously, if you guys enjoyed the video and you got to this, got to this moment, give it a like. I would very much appreciate it. I put a lot of hard work into this, and I love doing these great big projects, so thank you so much everybody for watching. If you haven't already, make sure to like this video, subscribe and ring the bell, click on some of these videos if you're new to the channel, or if you just want to see something new. I have a whole bunch of fake videos you can watch, and I have a Patreon as well, where you can donate a dollar and above, and you get access to a bunch of cool stuff. Thanks everybody for watching, I'll see you later, bye bye.